Okay, here we are. Hello and welcome. Here we are in lecture three. So we're getting right into the material. So as a reminder, you know, first lecture we introduced agile concepts, kind of motivated the whole course. I'm oh, sorry, I can take this off before I'm lecturing. Um, and then uh, in lecture two, uh, we just closed the loop, right? We ran a little bit of chisel, thrown through the whole flow, covered a little bit of Scala to get there. Today we're going to cover more chisel, touch a Scala, primarily do combinational logic. And it turns out that combinational logic, in this case, is going to be pretty simple. We can cover most of it. And then in our next lecture, which won't be Monday because it's a holiday, but Wednesday will be uh, sequential logic, how we register and how to do that kind of stuff. Cool. So let's get to it. As I said, um, we're going to kind of keep slowly layering things on. So, so far what you've seen, you probably can do in Verilog. And we're going to kind of keep adding more and more on, start getting a little bit more sophisticated, eventually start doing some pretty cool stuff. So Today we're going to do a little parameterization, a little bit of making your code more flexible, a little bit more generator like, a little bit less like a simple static instance. And hopefully by the end you'll be say, "Oh yeah, I can make a simple combinational circuit, no problem." That's kind of the goal. So I can go ahead and load up our notebook. Let this uh, imports go through real quick. And if, yes, sure. The next cell, yeah. So we're repeating this for the recording. Yeah, so with the Jupyter environment, uh, the given notebook, which in the case of the presentation, I can make it more clear, this actually is a Jupyter notebook. So it's like a single pane or a single you know, page. Yeah, uh, all the stuff lives in the same state space. So that's how it works. Um, and so yeah, so we're using something called Rise, which lets us turn this into a presentation. I think it's a pretty nifty little thing. Unfortunately, people are not supporting it anymore. So we're on shaky ground for long term. But for now, it's cool. Um, so yeah, it's kind of fun. If you haven't played with Jupyter much, uh, it turns out it doesn't need to be Python. You can do, in this case, Scala, thanks to Almond. Um, cool. OK, so we have code launched and ready to go. So what can we do? Well, uh, one thing you might want to build some MUX, right? So MUX is so common, multiplexers, right? You can just directly instantiated in Chisel. So uh, syntax is, you know, declare a mux. You're going to go ahead and have whatever your select signal is, and just one bit signal, either zero or one. This little detail gets me every time. Maybe folks are sharper than me. You put the true one first. So I would probably go zero one if I was making this normally. But they chose to go one zero. And the reason why is this is very, very similar to like a, the ternary logic. If you ever been like a ternary statement, where like in C or in Verilog, it follows that or true case, then false case, right? It's like if the true thing, else the false thing. So that's kind of following that logic. But as a pure harder person, I, I would prefer it on zero one. <laughs> but um, this is just one thing available, right? So here's you know our chisel, right? So we declare some inputs, uh, have an output, and then yeah, here's our mux. And um, if we want to see the result, we can see that in Verilog, of course. Uh, they have this design to be more concrete. And yeah, in Verilog, it actually chooses to use that ternary operator. So you can see very similar syntax, right? Select signal, question mark, true case, false case, right? Um, and so this is just one mux. There's actually quite a bit of stuff in the Chisel standard library. So I actually have a link here. If we follow that. Uh, we can see, for example, here is uh, documentation on, let's say, if you want to have a mux with multiple inputs. In this case, not just a multiple input mux. It's actually a mux for one hot. If you have a one hot style input to many input mux. But I mean, there's quite a few of these things out here. You can explore this later, and we'll be kind of going through these throughout the quarter. Um, OK, so cool. Mux, that's a pretty helpful tool. Right now, we can build circuits that can you know, choose between things. That's going to be helpful. Questions so far? OK. Um, so now we're going to switch back a little bit more about Scala. We're going to kind of go back and forth between Scala and Chisel in this course, trying to make sure we cover enough. In particular, I want to cover a little bit about how classes work in Scala. So Scala, like Java, everything is you know an object. Technically, Java has you know these primitive types. Scala doesn't have them at all, but it's very class-centric. It's object-oriented, right? And so unlike a lot of languages you may have seen, um, the class body is actually kind of like a function, right? It actually evaluates the entire thing, right? So many object-oriented languages you may have seen, you may have seen it kind of being like, OK, there's a class, and I have a constructor function, and I can declare other functions, maybe I have fields. Inside this class body, it can be anything. It can be individual lines of code and no methods, 
or it can be, you know, fields, whatever you want. And so the point is that this entire thing uh, is evaluated when you make the class instance, right? So you can have arguments to it, right? So you can say, hey, I want to make a class. And what's the constructor? This whole thing is a constructor, right? Uh, so in this case, we have an example of my class. And well, it takes in two arguments, our guess, which is a string, and our guy, which is an int. And sure, we can have an internal field. And we can even have it print some stuff out. So if I go ahead and run this, we can see a few things. First off, we can, you know, the way we define the, this code, and maybe we'll even come with it out and rerun it. Um, so yeah, you can see that, OK, we instantiate this with a new keyword. And by virtue of this whole thing being evaluated, you know, this body is evaluated, including printing out you know, the internals. And we have you know, this one particular uh, argument being passed over, no problem. Um, we also, of course, can uh, you know, query fields in here. By default, it's public. So yeah, I can say, you know, what's the name? The name is MC, yeah, it's that field. Okay, now we start figuring out some of the things it can't do, or some of the intentional limitations, right? So for example, if I try to assign name, it's gonna yell at us, right? And this is from last time, right? The reason why is we declared name to be a val. So if we made this a var, then sure, that's fine. Um, but, uh, I encourage you to use val just about every chance you can or all the time, in which case, yeah, this will not be allowed. Um, and so normally when you're making a function, you can figure out a way to kind of create a, a class such that you shouldn't need to change externally visible things over the course of the lifetime. Um, but sometimes you have to have vars and that's okay. Uh, okay, so that's one little detail. The other detail is if I try to, even though the fields of the class are public, if I try to print out this parameter, it's going to yell at me. And the reason why is by default, the parameters actually are private. And so we want to make a parameter public, which is very common sometimes. You can just put a val in front of it. And now I can do that. OK. And so we'll see some examples in a second. I just want to focus on the Scala portion in isolation before we bring this back to Chisel on the next slide. Let me all pause for a second if anyone has any questions in the meantime. Uh, OK, cool. So then, like I said, there's a lot of things involving you know, how to put methods inside a class or overloading. The reason why we're talking about this right now is that we use classes to um, hold modules in Chisel, right? So for example, here's a module. And now, because it's a class, we can go ahead and have arguments to our class. Or in this case, it's a parameter to our, mo our generator. So it's not just a single module. It's a module that's now it's a generator. In this case, we're not doing anything too crazy. It's still a mux. It's not really anything too revolutionary, but this mux's width is actually a parameter, right? So if we want to have this be, you know, 8 bits, 16 bits, whatever, uh, we just set that parameter and we instantiate it, right? So uh, if I come at this out and just run this, right, we can see, yeah, we define this class. Um, and so, yeah, you know, this is now a generator. Now, if we want to give it a specific instance, in this case, we'll instantiate it and say, I want with eight. Sure, then we'll get you know, a mux with eight bit wide uh, data path. We could just as well uh, you know, make that four bits wide. Sure, no problem. So it's already a very simple generator. Um, of course, we'll do much more sophisticated parameterizations as we go through this course. But this is, once again, kind of showing you that this is kind of be the model we're going to do. We're going to try and build these generators where we take in parameters and we're going to Specialize the design instance we produce to what the user is requested. In this case, they wanted a mux of arbitrary width. Uh, another thing I will point out is for remember how Scala has oh, this is a very finicky microphone. Um, Scala has these strong types uh, such that uh, you know, for example, um, when we have the width of uint, they need to be of a type width, not just a number, right? And the reason why this was done is that uh, they wanted to make it clear if someone writes uh, uint four, is that a four bit uint or is that a uint of the value four, right? Uh, you know, do you want a constant four or do you want something that's four bits wide? That's ambiguous. So they uh, decided to try to avoid that, right? And so instead, there is this notion of a type for widths, which is really just an integer, but it's a type. And you can 
cast set type with this dot w. So, okay, that's the thing I want a four bit u int. Um, if I want a constant for uh, of type u int, the way you do that is you cast to a u int. So, you can do this by doing the dot u. So, it's all kind of very carefully typed. So, that way you can tell the difference between things that are chisel types versus things that are Scala types. And so, if you try to connect a Scala thing to a chisel thing, it should yell at you at compile time because none of these are incompatible types. And so chisel things talk to chisel things, and Scala things talk to Scala things. And uh, sometimes you will cast Scala things to chisel things. Like in this case, you know, a Scala int to become a width. It's pretty rare to go to reverse direction from chisel to Scala because kind of, you know, you're going from weight hardware back into software. It's not something that makes sense physically, but it actually does happen inside test benches. You can imagine a test bench, you may want to interact with your design in a non-trivial way and actually read things back and think about it and send it back over. Unsigned, yes, yeah, great. We've seen a question for a recording. Yeah, to use for unsigned. Um, there is a signed integer, which we'll actually see in a couple slides. Cool. Okay. Um, and so uh, what we just covered was a mux, right? It's a piece of hardware to do combinational selection. Uh, there could be scenarios where you actually want to do the selection not in the hardware, but in the generator time you're making the design, right? So this is actually using a Scala if-else statement, right? So you've seen if-else in plenty of programming languages. Scala one's got a couple small twists to it. Uh, the interesting one is that if-else actually returns something. So in this case, the way it's written, we didn't actually return anything. Sorry, we didn't actually catch the value return, but it is returning something. It's returning whichever one you think selected. So in this case, condition is true. So the result of this statement is the value true. Now there's no variable on the left side that's to capture that result, but it is being returned. But there are times like this down here where you can use if, and it actually returns something. Okay, so if the condition I'll get three or four. So you can see in this little example, if I run this, yeah, okay, uh, because we've had this thing set to true. Okay, if you know true, we do a true case, sure. But then down here, for example, if true, we return three, right? Um, now, otherwise, of course, if I made this false, we would get the else path for both, right? We get the else path here as well as the else path over here. So this is a very common thing you're going to see in this language. Um, it's actually using if statements as part of um, like the functional programming, actually trying to return values select between things. But the key thing to remember is that you know this is something done when a program is running. So if you're kind of thinking more about how generator is working, you want to keep in mind what happens when a program is running, what's doing when a program is running versus what do you want to be in the generated hardware and kind of keep the two separate in your head? Um, so this is what you would use when the program's running. And as I said, you know, here, for example, uh, you know, if it's really small, you can do this all in one line. You can emit parentheses. This is kind of actually even encouraged by many style guides. Um, but, you know, longer things, of course, you can use braces and spread it out. Cool. Um, so now that we've talked about muxes and ifs in Scala, let's compared to, right? So if I'm doing a mux in chisel, that's making hardware, right? So that means in hardware, when you have conditionals, you actually are evaluating both possibilities and then you're choosing which one at the end, right? So in the case, let's say we're trying to do absolute value, or if a number is positive, you know, zero or greater, we don't need to do anything to it. We can just pass it straight through. But if a number is negative, we want to invert it, right? And so to do an absolute value, we can, you know, put together a mux with an inverter and a comparator, right? And so if the number is less than zero, then this is going to evaluate to one. So then we're going to take the path of it negated. Otherwise, you know, we're just going to take the thing unmodified, right? So that's the idea. And so we write this as a mux, sure, you know, do the comparison. And if it, this is true, meaning x is less than zero, then of course we want to invert it to make it positive. Um, otherwise, you know, we don't want to modify it at all. It's a positive number, so we can leave it alone. Uh, and so here's an example of that signed uh, type, essent. So this is going to be hardware, right? We're actually going to have hardware from mux and these two possibilities, right? So in, depending on the value of x as the hardware is actually operating, it's going to, you know, select a different way from this mux. But the point is that it's built the hardware for all these possibilities, right? And the reason why I'm being so deliberate about this, I want to contrast this from doing this in software, where let's say uh, I have a parameter, in this case, invert. And if it's true, we invert the signal. If it's not true, we don't. Um, 
in this case, you only get one of these in hardware, right? You don't get both possibilities, right? You're, this, this, this if statement's evaluated in the program as it's running, but it's only gonna take one path and you only get the hardware from corresponding to that one path, right? So if invert is true, then sure, X is gonna be inverted. Uh, if invert is false, then X is not gonna be inverted, right? And so you only get one of these. And so as you kind of get more familiar with your design process and how you're generating, you'll get more comfortable thinking about things in terms of, is this something I want to be decided at elaboration generation time, you know, by the Scala program, or does something needs to be decided in the hardware so that I actually put both possibilities into the hardware and the hardware, you know, dynamically choose accordingly. Cool. Questions? Okay. Um, so to talk more about this kind of Scala chisel uh, interfacing, uh, I had a couple of figures in the next few slides where I tried to imagine what's going on in memory <laughs> as the program's running, right? Um, for most of the schematics you'll see in this quarter when I draw schematics, I draw it like this. I actually draw the hardware like on the bottom left corner. But uh, to be really clear, you know, I want to kind of show what's going on. Sometimes people get confused which is which. And so when you think about what's going on with these hardware designs, it's actually kind of interesting to realize that it boils down to just instantiating and connecting components. That's all hardware is, is instantiating things and connecting them. Thinking about, oh, is it and or whatever? That's just a different type of instantiation. But in the end of the day, you're instantiating a logic gate or an operation of sorts, and you're connecting together. So really, that's all that's happening is we're instantiating things, connecting them together. That's kind of the main thing we're doing. And really, what we're doing is using Scala as a program around those operations to kind of choose what we're instantiating and how we're connecting them. Right? That's kind of the way you think of it. And so the reference system from the prior lecture is how when you're running uh, Chisel, you know, behind the scenes, the uh, language is a library is kind of keeping track of what you're doing and keeping track of various things. So as a user, you kind of can just say things in a very natural, expressive way, but it's kind of doing some, some work behind the scenes, right? And so in particular, uh, it's, you know, creating and connecting these hardware objects as you design them, right? And so what happens is as your program runs, it's going to instantiate these hardware components and connect them all together. And then eventually when your program is about to ready to terminate, it'll have created this graph of hardware components that are all connected. And then it's going to elaborate that term we use, where it's going to then turn that graph into a, it's technically fertile, but you can imagine eventually going to Verilog. It's actually going to turn it into code. But it's going to build up the graph first, right? And so uh, here's our example from before of our OR gate, or XOR gate, sorry. So yeah, so we have a you know, three input uh, thing, or two inputs, one output. So okay, we XOR two things together. Um, and so sure, we can go ahead and define this. and. I find that very distracting, I'm sorry. Oh, really? Last time I felt like if I changed the HDMI cable, it did less. OK. <laughs> um, but uh, so we run it, we get the Verilog, OK. What I want to point out is that you know we defined this my gate. That doesn't even bother appearing inside the Verilog, right? The Verilog just goes straight through. But let's talk about what's actually going on. So I've tried to like, color code this. If you think of what, what are the Scala variables versus what are like the chisel things that get constructed, right? And so, um, for example, uh, this statement, XORing A and B. So okay, it's gonna instantiate an XOR gate. It's gonna connect the two inputs to that, to these two things, right? So it's connect uh, this to the input A and the input B. So now you've created this thing, this XOR gate, and we're able to access this with reference to this because we assigned this to a Scala reference my gate. So that Scala reference my gate is pointing to this gate, right? And now with this gate, I can go ahead, with reference, I can go ahead and connect it to the output. And so you can kind of go through these lines, line by line. So you know, in the beginning, we're declaring the IOs. So the IOs are Scala objects, which point to chisel IO, you know, objects, these are imports versus outports. Um, and so you can kind of see what's happened. So at the end of the day, we've instantiated some ports, we've instantiated a logic gate, and we connected them together. And as a Scala program evaluates, you know, it's just kind of track of this, right? So the gate reference points to the logic gate. Um, we already have this bundle to keep track of these um, uh, 
uh, fields. So in Chisel, a bundle is a type they've made to be used for aggregates. So it holds multiple things together. In the beginning, we're using it just for the I.O. Uh, but later on, we'll make our own bundles and we can put other things in there and it can be used for I.O. or other things for wherever you want to use it. But you can think of it kind of like a struct. You know, it's able to have multiple fields that are named. Um, and so, yeah. Uh, cool. Maybe I'll pause for a second on the slide, folks. I have any more questions. Yes. That's fine. That would be perfectly fine. Yes. Yeah, so the question being, hey, if I'm still doing that, I you know just cut out this middle statement and uh, did this. Maybe I'll comment to sign out to be extra safe. Yeah, that's totally fine. No, this is totally fine to do it. Um, and uh, so. Um, the reason why I did it that way was that we could talk about a skull reference pointing to this gate. If I didn't do it that way, you have the same orange shape. It would still be you know, an XOR gate connecting two inputs to the output, but we wouldn't even have a way to reach that gate. It would be kind of like a floating thing, right? Technically, the Chisel library knows where it is, but me as a programmer, I don't have a way to touch it. And so that's kind of me giving myself a way to access that. Yeah. And so the reason why I mentioned this, the reason why I have this example, and other things I want to point out this example is so I'm trying to kind of show the machine scholar versus chisel types, but understand that uh, my gate, for example, is a scholar variable that is a reference to a chisel object. So in that case, it's totally okay for like the original expression to connect to it, even though it's a scholar variable, it's a scholar variable that points to a chisel thing. So this is still connecting a chisel thing to a chisel thing. And that's kind of the thing. So when you're assigning scalar variables, you use the equal sign. When you're connecting things in hardware, you use this colon equals for connecting. That means connect. So whatever the input for C is, is now connected to the output of the thing on the right, in which case it's my gate and my gate points to this XOR gate. So the output of this thing is what gets connected. Good question. Yes, yeah, so the question. Uh, is you know is this kind of like an intermediate statement in Verilog using a wire statement? Sort of. So the reason why it's sort of is there actually is a wire in Chisel, and I'll cover that in just a few minutes. Um, you have different motivations for doing things in different ways. As you start getting more complex generators, it's sometimes more convenient or even kind of necessary based on the way your code is structured to actually have like intermediate variables, right? Is you can't always put the entire math all in one line, and so it's good to have it. Now, as intermediate variables, the question is. Could they be these skull references or should they be uh, wires? And the answer is it depends what you're doing. Uh, sometimes you can get fine, just fine with the skull references. Other times you have to use a wire. Uh, we'll get to that in just a few minutes. Versus in Verilog, there's none just possibly like a reference, right? It's either a wire or nothing, right? <laughs> um, OK. Actually, not two slides. Next slide. <laughs> so. Uh, so yeah, we have a wire construct in Chisel. And so here I'm using it just like we did before, right? The difference is that, uh, notice how we have a scale reference to the wire, but now we connect to both sides of the wire, right? We set the wire's input to be the output of the XOR gate, and we set the input of the output IO to be the output of the, sorry, the input of the output IO to be the output of the wire, right? So you can see it's the same kind of thing. So here we have that wire and it's kind of presented and selecting over. So we'll see in a second why we might want to use wires. In this case, this may be a little gratuitous, this kind of showing functionality, but we'll see an example in a second. Yes. Correct. Yeah, I'm going to repeat that for the recording. That's a very good observation. So the observation from the student is with a wire, I can use it as both a source and a sink, depending on what side of the connection operator it's on, versus a skull reference can only be a source. 100% correct. Yes. So that's kind of one of the main motivations for having this wire construct is when the order which you know what the sink and source is going to be, perhaps is not the order you expect, right? Or <laughs> not the same place. If you have, if you have them both available, you can do those scale references easy, and it's kind of a more natural way to do it sometimes. 
you see, for example, in this case, in the design graph, there is a wire node here, right? There actually is something in the design graph. Now, it ha just so happens in this case, when we did the Verilog, we didn't see my wire named out because the tools recognized the wire did nothing and it just simplified it out. But it is there in the, in the design originally. Yes, go ahead. Uh, fertile. Fertile got rid of it. Yeah, so the reminder of the tool flow is you have a Scala program that runs. It produces something, it produces fertile, and then the fertile tool runs and turns out in the Verilog. And so the tool that takes your Scala program and turns into what they call high-level fertile, or technically churtle, uh, that does very little optimization. It's mostly just making sure you didn't break any grammatical syntax rules, and then produces this high-level IR, which then gets passed off to fertile to actually be what they call lower, to actually more concrete hardware, and that's the one that does optimizations. Um, like that. Cool. Okay. So yeah, the next slide is going to be like when. Remember my own slides? Yes. So now we're going to talk about an example of one you might start and want to use these wires. And the first one we don't use it, we'll use it in a second. So uh, we did conditionals when I started this lecture with muxes, right? In hardware, you want to have a hardware mux? Sure. When you're actually writing code, sometimes phrasing your thing in terms of a mux is a little cumbersome. So we have this when construct. And so what the when construct does, it just expresses the notion that there's possibilities here. Now the name to me is a little confusing because you know when implies some sort of temporal relation, right? You know, oh yeah, when this happens. This is not like an always walk in parallel. This is a basically a way to generate muxes. This is more convenient. So in the way I've written it right here, I've literally written this when statement to be a mux, right? So when io.s is true, this body is effectively happening, right? Meaning out of out is setting to io.in.one, right? If this is not true, we're in the otherwise, the else, and then io.out is connected to io in zero. So if you're sitting here going, wait a second, io.out is connected to what two things, all right? What's it connected to? The answer is connected to a mux that chooses between these two based on io.s, right? And so the creation of these muxes and the connection of all the control signals, that's done automatically by chisel. So here's a very trivial case. Um, but you start getting more sophisticated hardware, you may find yourself, uh, you know, having even nested when. So you have like a when, a when inside of a when, and it'll do the math about optimizing common cases and that kind of stuff. And so, yeah, you can do otherwise like an else. There's also an else when, which is kind of more like an if else. And so, yeah, so I mean, in this case, we're still in the same box we've been getting all day. Um, it's just we did it with a when. And I said, so these, these when statements turn into muxes, right? There's two possibilities, when the when is true and when it's not true. Um, so we'll have another example in just a second. Uh, so uh, when's, but even without when's, there's a possibility that a wire is connected to multiple times, right? Uh, and so the question is which one wins, right? You know, if I connect to something multiple times, what happens? This is one of the few times that the order of operations matter, right? In which case, the way it works in Chisel is the last statement to execute is the one that wins, right? So the last time you're connected, they call it last next semantics, right? So in other words, we have this wire W. At this point, we connected it only to one. Uh, then we pass it through a when statement. And so if this is true, we connect it to a seven and we're connecting the output to it, right? So you can imagine this process of the Scala program running, initially in a design graph, W is connected to a constant one. Then, we're connected uh, to this result of this when, which is a mux. And so the result is gonna be when you make a when statement, you kind of take the prior value of something, pass it into the false pass on the mux, right? And take the true case and pass it into the true case, right? And so, I mean, the hardware, sorry, the Verilog we're gonna see in a second is kind of what we expect, right? Where if we have this be true, the result's gonna be seven, right? It's like when this is true, seven, else, you know, it's gonna be the original version. So notice here that we didn't have an else or an otherwise, right? It was just, we had a default value and we're conditionally overriding it. But you know, that's program semantics. So that turns into hardware, it's a mux choosing between the two. Uh, and you might say, what happens if I don't have the default case? It's gonna yell at me, right? Hey, you don't always have a value for this, right? You have a value for it only some of the time, some of the other times it's not defined. And so uh, this is a way to do it. And this is not even just, so another thing you may have kind of already picked up on is that uh, IOs behave like wires, right? So you can kind of um, 
do things on them. The thing about IO is making them a little special, of course, is that whether it's input or an output, you should only be attaching on one side, right? You shouldn't be assigning to an input, for example, because that would mean you're competing with the actual input coming into the design. But you still can kind of use it in these next statements. This is called last connect semantics, which between last connect semantics and the when statements, you can take sometimes what would be very complex control logic, make it kind of a little more concise and easier to read. And understand that behind the scenes, it's all just getting turned into boxes and that kind of stuff. Cool. Okay. So one more example of last connect. So we're going to do the absolute value thing with a when statement, right? So we take in an input x, and we're going to turn the absolute value of x. And we can see, in this case, I didn't even use a wire, right? I set the output to be originally the value. And if it's negative, okay, fine, I invert it. Right, so that's hopefully maybe a little bit more clear of a you know, syntax if you're reading this. Uh, of course, we parameterize the width because we can, why not? Uh, if we want to look at the Verilog, uh, we can see that um, it's a little bit complicated because of signs in Verilog, which are not the nicest things. Uh, what's actually happening is it's generating the negative case, that's what this is. And so it's the market is signed and in order to do, there's no unary invert, just subtract from zero to get the inversion. Um, and then there's a muck choose between the two, right? Where uh, if you know it's less than zero, then sure, we'll return the signed you know, inversion. Otherwise, we leave it alone. And because we declare these things as uh, essence, you know, signed integers, we can do all the signed work and it's propagating that through the Verilog. But mostly I kind of wanted to show this as a little bit more clean. Um, way of doing the when statement. So you got, we're now seeing the box two different ways. Uh, you know, you, we did it with um, the box statement directly, which a lot of times is very clear. Uh, we did it with when and otherwise. Here is just when by itself with a default case we're, you know, conditionally overriding. Question, yes. Sure. Oh, that's, that's a great point. So I'm going to repeat that. Uh, so, you know, earlier I was very excited to say you should use val whenever possible. You should have immutable references. And the potential of last connect uh, seems to suggest doing multiple connections, which is very much immutable. I would agree. Correct. Yes. <laughs> um, so, to be very clear, what's happening in this case, though, uh, you are changing the connections in the chisel graph. You can have a design that is all valves, all valve, you know, Scala references that are immutable. But based on the order which next things are evaluated, you are changing the connections in the chisel graph. But yes, you are mutating the graph. That is true. If you connect something more than once, you are by definition mutating. Um, how to reconcile that with functional programming? Uh, no, I think you're right. That's a good critique. Uh, and it's one of these things where kind of the same times you have to be a little graceful and nimble when doing functional programming to try and avoid the need for a var. Uh, when it comes to hardware, sometimes you can. Like I said, at the end of the day, you could just have a mux, right? You can declare some mux from the beginning. But later on, when you have like a one statement that has, you know, 10 statements inside the one block, it's easier to write that than 10 muxes. <laughs> but I think your critique is right that, yeah, definitely doing multiple connections is a form of mutation. So that's not completely imbibing the immutable functional pureness. Okay, so another thing I wanted to talk a little about is we talked about you know having this width inference. So in, in this case, for example, uh, we have an adder, okay, it adds two things together. They're uints, so they, you know we have a set arbitrary width, okay. So if we do 8-bit input, we get an 8-bit output. Now, uh, if you add two 8-bit numbers, the result could be bigger than 8 bits, right? It could overflow. So in Verilog, actually, when you add, for example, it actually increases the width, right? You actually have a 9-bit available. And if you normally what you would do is you would crack, assign the result to an 8-bit value, and it would kind of quietly truncate it. Um, but chisel member has bit width inference. So we actually didn't even specify the width of this. And so you can see, for example, the default behavior of the plus sign 
is that it does truncate. But let's say we don't want that. Uh, well, then we can use the growing addition. It's actually going to grow up by one bit. So now I have a nine bit result. So that way there's no loss and it's going to grow accordingly. Um, for symmetry in the specification, they also have the explicitly truncating addition operator, which is going to be the same as the one above. I've seen this used pretty rarely in code. People just use plus and they want to truncate. And so it depends who you talk to, right? For example, uh, process architects kind of expect truncating addition, right? If I have a 64-bit number, just like a PC or something, and I add four to it, I don't want a 65-bit PC. I can't deal with that, right? So overflowing and truncating is what they want. You talk to folks who do single processing and DSP kind of work, they're like, no, I don't want to lose the value. And so both are possible in the language. Um, if you're sitting here kind of wondering, oh my gosh, how do I remember which one's which or when I use which one, uh, there's a cheat sheet, which is good for a lot of other things too. And so hopefully I can uh, tab over correctly. Yeah, so this is something maybe you can print out or just have this PDF handy. Um, so the, the Richard, as a student, made this a couple years ago. It's really helpful. And so it kind of summarizes all the syntactic details. And so I want to draw your attention for this conversation to the operators table. And so you can see that, for example, for a variety of operators, like something like plus, it's going to tell you uh, how wide the result's going to be. So in this case, it's saying the result of a truncating addition is the width of, your, of the wider of the two inputs, right? So actually, you, you could add things that are different widths, and it'll put them together. Now, if I want to be sure I don't overflow with addition, for example, then I need to add one, make it one bit wider to make sure I have room to capture the carry. And that's for addition. Let's say, for example, I'm doing multiplication, which there is no truncating version. Uh, the width of multiplication gets to growth quite a bit to not overflow. So it's actually going to be the, the sum of the two, right? So this is the um, uh, rules for language, how it does the uh, sizing of things. There may be cases where you know for sure you want, you know, this big input, this big output, and it's maybe not quite what's on the right. That's fine. You can connect them, and it'll quietly either sign, sign extend or drop. Uh, as a designer, though, I tend to like to leave some things unspecified to kind of let the inference do its work. Um, it's also just less code to express. You kind of like lend the tools, make the tools do the work. To kind of briefly pitch the rest of this PDF, yeah, it shows not just the core language features we was talking about um, and things like, you know, these other syntax we was talking about, like we was talking about when a minute ago. Uh, it also covers some of the commonly used API functions. So it's actually pretty helpful. Uh, I linked to this from the homepage, and you might be able to take a peek at this. Uh, it's also linked from these slides. Uh, cool. And like I said, so if you have width set and the things don't match, it will truncate or it will grow. And for uints, it always has a zero extend. For signed ints, it does a sign extension. Cool. Other questions? Cool. OK. Um, so let's kind of put things together and make it a little bit bigger of an example. So let's say, for example, I want to make a tool that converts between number formats, right? So for signed numbers, you may be familiar with two's common. It's the most common one you may be familiar with. There's also something called sign and magnitude, right? Where you have a bit in the case is positive or negative, and then the number, which is the absolute value. And then, of course, you can look at this, the sign bit to know if it's positive or negative. So if I want to build such a module, in this case, it takes in sign and magnitude number and transforms it into two's complement. Uh, what would I do? Well, I need to take in the sign uh, and magnitude number. In this case, it's, you know, it's a sign bit and some number of bits of magnitude. And we're going to be producing something that's two's complement. So from a encoding point of view, I need to actually make it one bit wider. Because remember, this one's w bits of number plus the information of a sign bit. So in other words, it's going to be w plus one bits worth of information. Uh, OK, so well, you can see, right? If the sign bit is one, we're going to find a sign bit being one, meaning it's negative. Then, of course, we're going to want to return the result of um, in two's common. So remember, two's common, if you remember the encoding, you negate the number, and then you add one. Right? Let's say the sign bit is 0, meaning it's um, positive. And the magnitude is a number in two's common. We don't need to change anything. We can just connect that straight over. So we can go ahead and run this. Um, and there we have it. Um, so like before, it tends to like to build up the pieces and then connect them together in the mux. Remember, of course, this is hardware, so 
even when you have a conditional, right, you always have the harder for both paths, right? You're already paying the harder no matter what. So it's kind of just arbitrary to the order in which it chooses to kind of declare these things and connect them together. But um, you kind of see it fits together, right? Okay, we have, uh, you know, the negation of a number, and then we um, uh, add the negation, add one to negation, and okay, it's either going to be the, the positive one or the other one. Now notice when we do, for example, the magnitude, when it's a positive case, we don't need to change it at all. It seems we're doing something over here. What's going on? It's actually concatenating a single zero bit on there, right? And the reason why is that the magnitude is one bit less than the result width, right? So it's kind of recognizing that difference. Because these are u ints, it's zero extending rather than sine extending. Cool. And uh, I think someone asked me this prior time. What happens if I use truncating addition here? Um, it's subtly incorrect. <laughs> um, so the reason why is that uh, it could be the case that you wrap around right in the in the right way. And so uh, without that symbol there, uh, it's going to do a seven bit addition here, for example. And so there could be a case where this overflows, but in the way you want that you compensate for. And it's not going to quite capture it. So actually, we did want to make sure that we're doing the arithmetic in this case on a slightly bigger number. Normally, it's not quite so um, uh, such crazy numerical analysis required to figure out what to do. You can just write the operator as you expect, and usually does the right thing. It's just sometimes when you kind of dig into this, uh, this kind of helps. Cool. OK. So um, a couple more things that are helpful for combinational logic. Uh, so when you have a uint, this is not true for a single bool, but when you have a uint and you have multiple bits, you, of course, can access a range of them. So you can say, you know, uh, you can access a single bit by just giving an index, or you can access a range by high, comma, low. Um, now, one thing that's been a feature to language, or I should say, not a feature, a limitation to language since the beginning, uh, which 3.6, which is coming out sometime this quarter, is going to finally change it around now like 10 years. Uh, you can now assign to a range. So it's called partial assignment, meaning if you have like a 10 bit number, right now you're required to assign all 10 bits at a time. You can't assign only one bit at a time. Uh, finally, with the you know, new version you know, coming out in the month, they're going to let you do partial assignment, which wasn't allowed before. So before, if you wanted to change only a few bits, you had to take the whole number. Uh, and concatenate the change bits with the original bits and assign the whole thing. And so now you can just do it all over together once. It's nice. That's amazing. It's coming after 10 years. Um, but okay, so what, what are features order for bit kind of twiddling kind of stuff? Like I said, you can access individual bits, you can access a range. Um, if you can concatenate, that is, you know, add put one and then put the other one after it. You can do that with the cat operation. You can also fill, right? So to kind of show these various things all put together, Here's a generator for sign extension, right? So you tell it how wide your input is and how wide you want your output to be. And then um, it's going to go ahead and sign extend it, right? So, uh, you know, first we look at the sign bit to see what sign it is. Look at the most significant bit so we know how wide it is. So we know, okay, if I have from 0 to Wn minus 1, Wn minus 1 is going to be the, the most significant bit. So we can go ahead and pull that bit out. We can also uh, then extend it, right? So we need to repeat that sign bit uh, however many times we need to grow, right? How many times we need to grow is the difference of the widths, right? And so we have the portion we grew, and we can cat it onto the original number. And boom, we've just done the sign extension. Uh, so it's kind of a little nice way of doing this. Um, and yeah, if we write the, run the Verilog for a second, uh, yeah, you can see the Verilog here is you know, pulling out that sign bit and then either putting in all ones or all zeros accordingly, uh, and then attaching that onto the number. So it's kind of the same thing, but perhaps this is maybe nicer to write in Chisel than it would be in Verilog. I also want to point out we're able to use like programming things. We're able to kind of put some assertions here to make sure this makes sense, right? Make sure that the input width is um, greater than zero. And the reason why is sometimes you actually have things in your hardware design that are width zero, which sounds a little broken, but it makes some of the generation corner cases easier if you can handle that. And so with zero things are legal in many places, and you can actually just automatically truncate that out the hardware and do the right things. Um, in this case, with zero is nonsensical because we need 
at least one bit to have a signed bit, right? So we actually are requiring to be at least one bit. Uh, we also, of course, are requiring to be an extension to require the output to be bigger than the input. Although I think we might well make this equal. I don't think that would break that. Let's see what happens. Find out. Will this break? Or will I cause the thing not to terminate? Oh boy. Yeah, I did this earlier today. Um, so this is a Jupyter thing, not a Scala thing. So uh, they've been doing a lot of work to um, make Chisel seem more natural. And so as a result, Chisel's going from what is purely a library to actually using what's called compiler plugins. So Scala has the ability for people to actually make a plugin that runs in the compiler while compiling your program to actually do more sophisticated language things. And so the reason why they're doing that is they can give you better error messages. The problem with that in our case is it's not playing as nicely with uh, elements. And so we actually don't have the plugin running at all. So as there's more and more functionality put into the Scala compiler, sorry, Chisel compiler plugin, we're not gonna see that in Jupyter. And so I imagine this is erring and we're just, we're just knocking that message back. Um, if we ran this with a more full-fledged uh, environment where you actually have SPT, the actual proper tool running, we'll probably send a message right now telling you that, oh no, you can't concatenate a zero-bit thing, which actually you probably could. I'm curious who's going to be complaining about this. Um, yeah, it's a good question. Like, what, So something here is going to be unhappy. Uh, is it the fill? Is it the cat? Um, yeah, I feel like cat should be okay with a zero-bit wide input, right? There shouldn't be a, anything wrong. And then Phil, it's honestly, to me, it's something it should work with zero bits, but perhaps it doesn't. That's why it's breaking it. Um, good thing this is the last slide. Uh, but <laughs> the Drupal is a little bit more fragile. Um, but that's a good thing to keep in mind. Cool. Other questions? OK, well, so uh, that's going to wrap up the lecture, but I want to spend a minute to kind of cover the roadmap for coursework. So. As we get start going full speed, we're going to have one lab and one homework per week. And so lab's going to be one of these Jupyter notebooks, and then homework's going to be uh, you running an actual code, perhaps you know, with the, in, with the IDE like IntelliJ, which I recommend, or maybe you're running your own favorite text editor. That's fine. Um, so homework's going to be more substantial, and so we're a little behind posting both. I was hoping to have uh, them posted by today's lecture, did not happen. So I'll have the lab posted later today. Homework probably posted over the weekend. Uh, the lab, we'll say, is due Thursday, because remember, Monday's a holiday, so you have some time to kind of look it over. And the lab, hopefully, shouldn't take too long. And we've covered, I would say, 80% of the material required for the lab. We're going to talk some more in Wednesday's lecture about testing, but you can probably understand what's going on uh, as it is. If need be, we can push the lab back a couple days. So one of the things about this grad course, we can be a little bit more flexible about deadlines. It's not like a super grueling sprint. Um, Homework will be longer, and so I want to make sure we get it just right, so that we don't have to worry about, you know, pulling code changes. <laughs> uh, and so we want to get that one just right. And that one will probably have at least five days, if not a week. And so, yeah, if it not be hosted today, you're it's probably not going to do any sooner until next Friday, if not the week after. Cool. Any other questions? Yes. Yeah. Yes, yeah, so I'm going to repeat that. Uh, so the question was, OK, for writing something like the lecture repo, um, where does the virtual environment fit in? Uh, the virtual environment's up to you, right? So actually, on my own laptop, I'm kind of reckless. I don't have a virtual environment. I just you know, uh, YOLO it, and I had that pain this week. I actually lost quite a bit of productivity when I broke my Jupyter setup, and I had to work really hard to rebuild it. Um, so those that are familiar with virtual environments, a way in Python to kind of declare like a workspace, and that way, you install all dependencies in that workspace, and that way, if you have different products you're working on and they require different versions of the same package, you don't conflict. So that way you kind of do it. And so the install.shell script that's included inside the lectures repo um, is a little bit more better behaved and actually makes a virtual environment install Jupyter. It's a very big thing to install inside of a virtual environment, but does it and it installs the other things required for the slides, and then it runs. Um, as a backup for today, actually, I launched the uh, binder. And I guess because I was gone too long, it died. Uh, it probably launched, and after 15 minutes, it times out. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, so yesterday, it was, I was working with the binder, and it kept dying. And I ran it this morning, and it worked perfectly. I'm like, where have you been all week, right? And so um, 
for all we know, this may not be the service we want anymore. I've been using it for a few years, and maybe they're having trouble on their end server-wise. So if you have any recommendations for a different Jupyter repo hosting service, let me know. Um, I might search around for another one, see if we can't migrate. Yeah, so Google Collabs or, or GitHub Classroom are the obvious other alternatives. And so this one was kind of nice because it was like a way to like just do it. But yeah, maybe, because we'll see. Part of what happens, we can peel the hood a little bit. So if you look at the install.shell script, um, which is what you mainly run, as we discussed, right, there is this set of virtual environment. Uh, and then you, of course, um, well, first you install a virtual environment, then you make one for this, right? And then you activate it, install all the stuff, right? And so you're installing Jupyter. We actually require some stuff to make the slides look pretty. Uh, if you don't install these things, you can still use a notebook just fine. It's just not going to be pretty like the way I'm presenting. Um, so split cell is actually the one that's the most finicky. Uh, this is a split cell. There's two cells side by side. That's not normal for Jupyter. Um, and then, uh, so Jupyter by default can't run Scala. So you need to install Almond, which is the thing that gives us a Scala support. And so that uh, is this whole process here where we download yet another program called Corsier that we use to install the right version of Almond to get the right version of Scala. It installs that. So now your Jupyter supports Scala via Almond. To tie it up, we remove that stuff, right? Um, so then inside of your slides, if I go back to the beginning, uh, we have this in two lines. The reason why we're using two lines, we're actually like telling the interpreter to load in this file. So it's actually, it's like reevaluating this whole file. So we need this complete before we can do the imports. And so this resource, uh, Chisel Depths, is kind of the secret sauce that connects a lot of stuff together. So um, this, uh, yeah, so this, you know, brings in things like the right versions of Chisel and stuff like that. And there's a variety of functionalities in here we're using. For example, you saw in the first, second day, we know we did like a visualization. That shorthand was done by this work here. Um, or when we look at Verilog for things, uh, we're calling some stuff inside the Fertile tool. And then we're moving, running this code called remove all comments, which just strips off the comments so it looks prettier. So yeah, so now you've kind of seen behind the veil, so to speak. Uh, technically for Binder, it actually runs this other program. Uh, so make the, so Binder is nice, but let's actually like customize the instance a little bit more free than your average place. So you're actually able to install some packages via app, such as a JDK for Scala, uh, graphics visualizing stuff. And then Z3, we're going to use later on the quarter, is an SMT solver. Actually, we can do formal uh, assertions with Chisel, which is pretty cool. Um, you describe the environment. Sure. Um, exactly like a Docker. Yeah. Um, yeah, that might be good. Um, in hindsight, I'm not sure that we need all of these. <laughs> the, 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 that middle four. We definitely need Python and Rise. Rise is what you use slides, but I don't really plot or do pandas, so maybe we can make this a little faster. Um, and then post build, like we just saw a second ago, we actually install, every time you launch this in Binary, it actually installs Almond on the fly. Now, the reason why this isn't so painful, Binary is working correctly for a given commit is supposed to cache the image. So that way, if one of you asks for it and another one of you asks for it, you get the first one's cached image. And so it shouldn't be so, quite so painful. That would be a Docker. Because a Docker, you know, checkpoints every step of the way. And so it shouldn't be so painful. But Binder has been very unflaky this week. So I don't know what's going on. Yes, question. Um, yes, I'm not sure I can get that out in time for lab one. Um, yeah, that might, that might be the simplest thing. Um, maybe. So yeah, please, please, yeah, but it's, this is Slack, so please share this on the Slack, yeah. For the beginning of the quarter, the Slack is almost always questions about how to make this tool work. That's great, use the Slack. And myself and Yuan Peng will try and answer those questions. Um, yeah, I'm sorry, it's a little bit bumpy. So normally Binder is pretty smooth, but yeah, I would agree that, you know, Binder has not been as reliable. Yesterday I was working really hard and Binder kept crashing. I'm like, what are you doing? Um, it's kind of a little bit of, Every, every teaches class once a year, so every time he teaches class, it's like, 
when infrastructure is broken or not broken. So for example, I found that in the last year, the split cell functionality is even more deprecated than before. So we're on, we're on thin ice with, with split cell. Um, but yeah, it's been fun. There's a lot of coding. We're getting a lot of stuff together. And so notebooks are just kind of one environment to kind of do things quickly. Uh, it's kind of a more unusual way to use Chisel. Uh, normally you use like a regular IDE and like a full size program. But I, the notebook's kind of fun for lecturing and doing labs. And normally it's kind of a fun thing. But uh, other than this class, and then there's actually called the Chisel Bootcamp, which actually pioneered the notebooks for Chisel. Um, I don't know who else uses Chisel and Notebook. It's kind of not your normal way of programming. I had a former grad student that really loved notebooks and wanted to write large projects inside notebooks. Um, and there's actually a whole community called MBDev that does this. It actually like write large programs inside notebooks. You like mix documentation and test benches and code all together. And he did that for six months and then he changed his mind. Um, <laughs> but so you, you can definitely get excited about uh, notebooks. Cool. Great. Any other logistic questions? Cool. Okay. Well, yeah, keep an eye on the thing. I'll update the web page and I guess I can announce on Slack people know it's there. Hopefully I'll get this all generated. Sounds good.